Let's turn to Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20 today, and we're going to begin in verse 8 in just a moment, Exodus 20 and verse 8, and as our video just uh, captured the sentiment of that better than I could, uh, we do honor those who have died in service of our country, and it was just a few weeks ago in Arlington Cemetery, my uh, son Ian, we had a trip to D.C. together, and just walking those hallowed grounds, uh, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, um, et cetera, et cetera, just to see um, what that represents and to feel it, to smell it, to see it, uh, just the, the whole feel of that. Uh, if you've never been there, I encourage you to go someday. We have even just the Western Reserve just north of us. Uh, just walk the grounds and just uh, pause and absorb their sacrifice. Um, I can't remember the exact quote. I meant to write it down before our service today, but something to this effect, you can judge a culture by how they treat the dead and specifically how they honor the dead. And I'm grateful that we still live in a country where much time and resources and manpower is put into honoring the memory of those who have sacrificed. And I hope that you'll do your part today to be a part of that this weekend. Don't lose sight of that in the midst of all the festivities and other things you may have going on. Uh, that we need to celebrate and commemorate those who have died for our freedoms. Let's stand together if we're able to do so for just a moment. Exodus chapter 20, out of respect for God's Word. Good to have several guests with us here. Welcome to North Life. We're thrilled you're here. If you're back, if this is your first time here, we trust you received a welcome packet in there, some information about our church. If you would, fill out the front side of that connection card. We'd love to have a record of your visit. Uh, your visit. You can put that in the offering plate at the end of the service. Uh, we're so glad you're here today. Exodus 20, let's begin in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do not any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. 4, verse 11, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all, that is in, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And so if you're here for the first time, just to bring you up to speed and a reminder for the rest of us, we're looking at the top ten, these ten commandments God gives us in Exodus 20, and their significance to the New Testament believer. And today, we're looking at this aspect, intentional rest intentional rest. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness today. Thank you for the joy it is to be here. Thank you for this weekend uh, that, Lord, you've blessed us with as Americans and all that it means uh, for us and for the past and for the future. I pray that we would do right by those who have died defending and securing our freedoms. And Father, we would uh, be grateful to veterans and others, Lord, that also have served our country. We thank you for this day and this time we can share together around your word. I pray you'd help me today to be a good steward with the privilege, the great privilege, the awesome privilege that someday I'll stand and give account for of opening your word and preaching and teaching it. I pray as well for each that is here that will listen and will respond that they also too would steward this opportunity that so many in other places do not have, and that is to open your word and to allow your spirit to teach us and to transform us to be more like Jesus. Bless this study, be honored in it, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. You ever heard the expression before, beauty sleep? You know, get your beauty sleep. Um, I have never really checked into the background of that expression, where it came from. But the other day, someone asked this question, which I think is so true. Why is it called beauty sleep when you wake up looking like a troll? Um, I don't know about you, I don't wake up looking better than when I went down. You know, there's, there's slobber, saliva out the side of my mouth, I got bedhead, um, you know, I'm sure the, what's issuing from my mouth is not the most pleasant smell probably. We tend to kind of fall apart, don't we, when we sleep, and then we have to prop ourselves back up in front of the mirror every day and try to make ourselves look presentable. Can I just say as we begin today, rest is a sacred thing. And I'd like you to think about today where maybe in this area of rest, God wants you to change some things, grow in some things, uh, and, and, and maybe even add a few things in your life that will help you capture the spirit of this fourth command. Now, as we begin today, can I just say this? We're on a holiday weekend. It's funny how the Lord does that uh, sometimes in the sequencing out of our, our book by book or verse by verse studies. And we're in a, a weekend where maybe you're not working quite as much. Maybe you're working more than you normally do, depending on what industry you're in. 
But rest often is something, and specifically this verse, verse 11, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, that is tough for us as New Testament believers to process. And I've heard a lot of teaching, and I've seen a lot of extremes one way or the other in application of this fourth command. But I would submit to you, at least in spirit, it is still applicable, and we need God's help and wisdom to apply it in a way that pleases and honors Him. And before you read past verses 8 through 11 and say, well, that's just for Jews, or that's for uh, someone who still subscribes to a Jewish way of living in this day, may I remind you of how important it was to God and how important it was to His people, and therefore maybe how important it should be to us. One author said this, if the fourth commandment can be confusing and controversial, just because it can be, doesn't mean it is less important. In fact, you can make the case that the Israelites would have understood the fourth commandment to be the most important of the ten. Isn't that striking? Uh, to me, the first few we covered, thou shalt have no other gods before me, don't make a graven image. Uh, some of those taking his name in vain seem to be a bigger deal. Uh, in fact, it is for starters, it's the longest and most detailed command. And you see that the four verses that we read. It's the most detailed of any of the, of the Ten Commandments. Moreover, the Sabbath observance is mentioned more often than any other of the Ten Commandments. Eleven times in the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible, and over 100 times in the Old Testament. And may I just say today, even if we conclude that certain parts of it no longer apply to us as New Testament believers, we would be wise to observe the principles of rest, the principles of worship, and allow this truth to have some application in our lives today. So the thought today is physical, emotional, and spiritual renewal will not just happen. Um, you'll not be refreshed and renewed just by default. Oh, a month has slipped by, and I feel so refreshed and so rested. Uh, it's something that we must invest effort into. We must do with great intentionality. And I will tell you, if you're wired like me, rest is hard. Uh, taking a break, unplugging from things, especially with the technology and, and access to things that we have nowadays, to truly learn intentionally to practice rest. So the question today is, in a world that's crazy busy, how do we maintain a regular rhythm of schedule that includes this intentional rest? Let's look at today our outlines in your bulletin. If you choose to fill in a few blanks, that will help you uh, guide you through our study today. A law-abiding believer obeys God with two intentional moves uh, toward rest. Let's talk about those in the balance of our time this morning. Number one, first of all, you and I need to have in relation to rest a memory that remembers the Sabbath. Go back to verse 8. We find both of our main points in verse 8 and then unpacked in the verses that follow. But notice the beginning of verse 8, uh, God says to Moses and to his people, remember the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day. And I want to show you just a picture I think captures where we are at as a country. Uh, you see this cartoon on the left. This is, a, this is great. I wish every weekend was Memorial Day. And then to the right, for some families, it is. Um, do you know that we have in our, in our mind, often we tend to forget the reasons behind things? Memorial Day was not ordained and instituted in our country to give you a Monday off to grill some hot dogs with your family. There's something more going on there. There's something to be remembered. And can I just say today in reference to God and to His intentions and commands for us, there's something to remember. What's behind it? And here's the question. Why would God institute this command? And what significance does it have even today? To do Sabbath rest requires properly viewing it through the lens of history, this relationship between God, who's the same as he was in Exodus 20, and we who have flesh, the same kind of flesh as the Israelites in Exodus 20, what's in there, what's in there for us uh, that we are wise to observe and foolish to disregard. All right, let's talk about two areas found here in our text. Number one, remember the Sabbath by remembering what has occurred in the past in the area of creation. Go to verse 11. And so you see God laying this foundational truth that is what we build our own Sabbath or observance of Sabbath rest in our lives. For in six days, notice verse 11 of Exodus 20, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. Uh, that's profound, isn't it? In six days God did that, a rather uh, challenging task for we to understand, but He did it. Notice, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Remember the Sabbath that we see in creation. 
Now, in verse number 8 that we began with, what is the first word of Exodus 20 and verse 8? It is what? Remember. And so, therefore, we can conclude that the Sabbath that God is telling His people about was not instituted in Exodus chapter 20. He's saying, remember it, which means its institution preceded the law given here in Exodus 20 and verse 8. And so there's a remembrance, and the first way that we are to remember the Sabbath is in reflecting upon how God instituted it at the dawn of creation. The Sabbath did not begin at Mount Sinai. It began when God created this earth, and when He made us, He realized there was a need for rest. There was a need for modeling it and, and teaching His people to follow in like fashion. May I give you two memories of creation that should structure our rest? These are not on the slide but should be there in your bullets and you could jot these down. Number one, two memories of creation that should structure our rest. Number one, God made the week. God made the week. If you think about creation, there's a rhythm to our schedule. Is there not? You have, um, you have months that are set to the lunar uh, cycle. Um, you have years that are set uh, in reference to the result of the, the Earth's revolution around the sun. Sounds like it feels like we got just a little ahead of ourselves on that revolution in the last couple of days. It was what, 92 or whatever it was yesterday? This weekend was warm. But there is a cycle that's defined by the heavens uh, months by the moon, years by the earth's revolution around the sun. So we see in and even the rise of the sun and the setting of the sun, days even. But where does the week come from? What, what, what cycle in our world creates the weekly rhythm? No, nope, nothing. God does. God said, here's what I did when I made this earth. I'm setting this as a precedent that six days you will labor and on the seventh day you will rest. And so he made the week. It comes from and issues forth from his plan and purpose. And if you think about it, every week as we go through our Sunday and our Monday and our Tuesday and we work through our whole week, we are, we are submitting to, again, God made us. And God has a way forward for us that includes this intentional rhythm of rest. All right, number two, jot this down, God made the Sabbath. God made the week. Number two, God made the Sabbath. At creation, God made all things. In the beginning of verse 11, at the end of verse 11, He also made the Sabbath. Like so much of our theology, we have to go back to creation. We have to go back to Genesis to observe what God reveals to us there and what its application is in our lives. Um, so if God made the Sabbath at creation, then this whole we're under grace and not under the law is irrelevant in some ways, is it not? If God made the Sabbath at the same time that He made us, then as long as there's us, there's at least some implications of this rest in our lives. And so God is the one that ordained the Sabbath. You ever practice what we call preventative maintenance? Um, I like no maintenance. And if I'm really put in a corner, I like low maintenance. Um, and and I, I believe, I'm a big believer in preventative maintenance. Don't wait for it to break down. Service it. Take care of it. Uh, before it breaks, you fix it. Before it breaks, you maintain it. And I believe God who made us has given us a manual, and found of it, some of it's found here in Exodus 20, of how we are to long-term prevent certain things and protect from certain things through this rhythm of rest. You remember in the New Testament, Jesus and the Pharisees, what was the biggest struggle? What was the bi- if you had to boil it down to one word, they kept arguing about, what was that word? Sabbath. This couldn't be done on the Sabbath, and this had to be done on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, forget you guys, there's very little of that in the Bible. You guys have added all these things to our observance of the Sabbath. And he says in Mark chapter number 2 and verse 28, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. It is His. God made it. He tells us what we're to do with it and what we're not to do with it. And so there's this, this control, this authority that God has over the Sabbath. He is the one who made it. Can I give you just a quick example of how this applies, this idea of the Sabbath that's in creation? We are created. What should this mean? The author said this, the Lord's day is the first day of a new week. It is the eighth day. It is not the day of recreation per se, but of recreation, to cease from what is necessary and to embrace what gives life. We're not just va- uh, vacationing or evacuating, but we are recreating. Let us approach every Sunday and every season of rest Uh, asking, what blessings does God mean to give me as I worship and rest before Him today? And so there's this recreating. 
I see in our day, many of us, we are made by God, but we're trying to make life work our own way. And we work and we work and we work. And we do not submit to how he has made us also requires a season of rest. All right, hold your place there in Exodus 20. Would you go to Deuteronomy for just a moment, chapter 5? We'll come back to 20 of Exodus in just a moment. Go to the next book, or two books, Exodus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. And if you would, look at chapter 5 and verse 15, and we see a second reference to the Sabbath uh, that helps us remember it in a way that truly honors and pleases the Lord. God says, remember the Sabbath, okay? We remember that it was instituted creation. What other memories should we have associated in our observance and our honoring God with intentional rest? Deuteronomy chapter 5, and if you would please look at verse 15. Verse 14 has the same language of, cha- of verse 10 in our text that we'll come back to in just a moment. But look at verse 15 as God is rehashing his law to his people. Verse 15 And remember, there's the word again, that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord, therefore, based upon that, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. So we remember the Sabbath, first of all, in creation. Number two, in our redemption. We remember the Sabbath in this area of rest, in this area of renewal through um, salvation, through our redemption. Um, I don't know about you, have you ever been in a public setting? Well, here's the question. Do any of you not order something when you're eating in public with other people because you just know I can't do that in a delicate, reserved kind of way? There's certain things that I eat with my hands, like you know, ribs probably with some highbrow person is not the best move, Okay, especially if your job's on the line in reference to that lunch you're having. Um, one of the ones that I'm a little hesitant to order in public is spaghetti. I'm talking real spaghetti, you know, especially... Uh, if they don't give you the little spoon that you can twist it on. The other day, I saw the most hilarious video. I don't know if you notice, we guys, as we get older, we just don't care how we look anymore. We don't care what it looks like. Um, some of you know that better than I and your family. But there was a video, a girl, a lady posted online of her dad sitting at the dinner table by himself eating a bowl of spaghetti. And he would, he would just scoop a big wad. And then off frame, you saw him pull into the frame a pair of scissors. <laughs> and so he would scoop, cut swallow, scoop, cut, swallow. And he just went through this like, who cares? You know, let's just cut it off. Forget the twisting, just snip it off. And he had this big pair of shears, these, pick, these, these scissors, he would just trim them off. Um, do you know there's certain things that God wants to free us from? He wants to release from us the, the hanging, if you will, appendages of burdens and challenges. And maybe just a statement to jot down this morning, that I think will help you and we'll unpack it in just a moment. Here's the statement. In Christ, we don't have to be slaves to a a tyrannical schedule. We don't have to be slaves to a schedule. In Christ, we don't have to be slaves to a schedule. God has freed us from that. Two memories I would give you that should structure our rest. So we remember creation. God made the week. God made the Sabbath. we got to remember that. We're not above that or beyond that. We're not the exception. Number two, two memories of redemption that should structure our rest. Number one, jot this down, we are no longer slaves. We are no longer slaves. Now, where Exodus chapter 20 is written to a bunch of ex-what? Slaves. Do you think their building of the, the glories of Egypt affected their worship just a bit? It's very likely that there was no Sabbath. They may have still tried to, those who were faithful, the remnant tried to somehow still honor God on that seventh day, but they were working, they were working, they were working. And so we see God freeing the slaves. And here in Deuteronomy chapter 5, he says, I have freed you. And therefore, because I freed you, one of the main reasons I freed you is so that you can enjoy and experience the worship and rest that comes on the Sabbath. We are no longer slaves. So we're not talking about being sloths. We're not talking about being lazy. We're talking about being able to serve and worship the Lord. Exodus 7 and verse 16, one of the many refrains as Moses goes into Pharaoh and he asks for uh, Pharaoh to let his, God's people go. And in verse 16, let my people go that they may serve me. Uh, and so it was a, it was a freedom to not, no longer be a slave, instead to be a servant of the Lord. And so we've been free not to serve ourselves, but to serve the Lord. This includes even how we manage our Sabbath rest. Can I just encourage you, do not leave today saying, well, pastor teaches, and this church teaches, and I think even the Bible teaches, that I deserve to have a day for myself. Uh, Be very careful with that. I think there is renewal. There are things that can occur in a season of rest, but ultimately our rest is so that we can rejoice in the Lord, 
so that we can worship the Lord, so that we can honor Him in ways that to this point maybe are not consistent in our lives. We are called, we are no longer slaves. Number two, jot this down, we are called to be worshipers. We're no longer slaves. Number two, we are called to be worshipers. And I'll just put this to bed this morning if you struggle with this. The New Testament believer is not called to observe the Sabbath as some are trying to push and promote in our day in the way that we see reference to the Israelites. You know that, right? Uh, we, we are not in relation to God in the same way as the Israelites were. So we're not proposing that whatsoever. But there is, under the new covenant, an obligation as well as an opportunity to meet together to worship the Lord. And if you look at it in the New Testament, it shifts from Saturday to Sunday, does it not? Whereas they would meet together and they would come apart together in the Old Testament on the Sabbath day, the seventh day, the Saturday, now we gather on the first day of the week. Acts 20 and verse 7. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, there are many verses that reference them meeting on the first day of the week. Um, Not to pick on anybody, but I think we should meet for church on Sunday. I think it's a biblical mandate. Uh, And in our day, we have alternative services and things people are able to be a part of. I'm not knocking that per se, but we meet on the first day of the week. It's the Lord's day. It's a day that we honor God and celebrate the resurrection and all of these things that give us the opportunity to worship. With that being said, the spirit of the law, though it may not be what it was at one point in the life of God's people, here's the rhythm. And I would jot down these three words, rest, rejoice, and repeat. Rest, rejoice, and repeat. And what I see in our day is a lot of resting and repeating, but there's no rejoice there. There's no worship there. We have been called to practice Sabbath rest, and that Sabbath rest is a call to worship. Trusting the Lord means resting from business as usual on the Sabbath. It means gathering for sacred assembly, and we have this rest and worship. We rest so that we might be free to worship. We give to God worship, and in part, then we are able to fully trust and rest in Him. Um, You ever heard the challenge before, you know, was it pat your head and rub your belly or the other way around? Don't do it right now. I can't do it. I have tried. I mean, I'll, I'll look in a mirror and try to get myself to not do the same thing with both hands. I just, I can't do two separate things with, that are connected to this body. That's how most of us men are. It's one thing at a time. Slow down. We're to two. I can't handle that, okay? Stick with one at a time. When it comes to our worship, just a thought today, why does God want us to rest? It is for our benefit. Everything God calls us to do is for our good, but it is also for what? For His glory. For his glory. There is a sacredness to our work, but a unique level of worship we cannot offer God while working. We only can offer him that level of worship when we're resting. And so trust God with that. Be willing to come apart. Be willing to set aside time that you rest, and in that rest, give to God his glory and worship. Um, some of you may struggle with Exodus 20. Pastor, why are we in Exodus 20? We're New Testament believers. We're part of a local New Testament church, the emphasis upon the New Testament. And I, at times, have also struggled with how to apply the Old Testament, but they are given to us for our example and for our challenge and our exhortation. The other day, I came across this statistic that profoundly changes and grows my understanding. An author said this, only 12 chapters in the New Testament don't have a reference to the Old Testament. Isn't that amazing? Only 12 chapters of the entire New Testament don't have a reference to some foundational truth in the Old Testament. And so Christ came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And one of the ways that we can fulfill and honor Him more fully is by honoring Him through Sabbath rest. The Sabbath is grounded both in creation and redemption. It is a regularly scheduled sign of God's redemptive, creative purpose at work in our lives. Do others see us resting Are we a model of that? All right, number two, go back to our text in Exodus 20, and let's spend a few minutes in the last part of verse 8, and then the verses that kind of unpack this idea. So ways that we practice intentional rest. Uh, We do so, first of all, by remembering the Sabbath. Are you remembering it uh, through the lens of creation and through the lens of redemption? All right, number two, go to the end of verse number eight. He says, remember the Sabbath day. Notice, secondly, to keep, notice this, to keep it holy. Number two, we need to also have sanctified rest. We remember rest. Number two, we sanctify rest. We, we honor God and how we steward it for his glory 
and honor. The other day I came across this hilarious picture. I'll show you the picture and then this caption. All right, there's the picture and this caption. When the preacher went and done called that sin by name. You got to be kidding me. He just actually said that was wrong. He just went done and called it sin. That's just, I can't believe that. Do you know sometimes in our lives when it comes to rest, um, we're willing to acknowledge what it is, but we're not as willing to, to acknowledge what it's not. Many of you today, you're trying to rest your way in relationship with God, but you have things in your life you're tolerating. You have habits. You have ways of approaching life and relationship with God, and you're not willing to come apart and rest. You're not willing to separate from and separate unto to experience this rest that God alone can provide. Sabbath rest will not just happen. Uh, There's much fighting against that must be done. There's much resisting it that must be uh, eradicated if we're to have rest. All right, let's talk about a couple of areas. Number one, sanctify the Sabbath with distinction. Go back, if you will, now to verse number nine. Sanctify the Sabbath, this concept, this spirit, if you will, this law and this command with distinction. Verse nine, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. I'm going to give you two consecrations of distinction that should structure our rest. These are two truths or concepts that provide structure or boundaries to how we rest before the Lord. Number one, jot this down, we need to work hard. Verse 9 talks about that. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. We need to work hard. I remember in Bible college, it had been my senior year, Heidi and I got married between my junior and senior year. And we were just in survival mode, trying to pay bills and get through college. And we worked tons of different jobs and just tried to get through and not have a bunch of college debt at the end of that year. Um, And a sweet time together, but also just an all-out struggle. I remember the first summer that we were married, I did uh, roofing. I managed a roofing crew for a company over in Carroll County, a man that I knew that I'd worked for for several years. And we worked hard. I mean, we worked very hard. It was good money, made good money. But it was hard work. Hot days, you know, I always would think, why are we doing roofing in July or August in in Ohio? Why not, you know, at least milder times in the fall or the spring? But anyway, roofing like crazy. And we would typically work 12 hours was an average day. And I remember working back-to-back 16-hour days regularly where we, you literally, it wasn't the 16-hour day, it was the next morning getting up and trying to get yourself going again. I remember it was so hot, I literally was just baked I, I suffered that whole summer with nosebleeds like crazy because I got so dried out. My body, it just, and I'm, I'm telling you, when I came home, you didn't have to preach at me, hey, Harley, you need to take a nap. You need to rest. I knew I needed rest. And the work and the labor uh, prepared me to be ready to rest. There's a sweetness of rest that comes only on the other side of hard work. There's no rest like the rest that comes after working hard. Ecclesiastes 5.12, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. You ever worked hard and then you kick up your feet? There, there's just a, there's a rest that's there. There's a, there's a soul level, bone level kind of need for rest. And so laboring hard, you see in verse 9, we're not talking about just kicking up your feet for the, the foreseeable. It's stri- strive and labor and then allow this rest rhythm to be a part of that. Um, can I give you just a practical tip that I think ought to be typically what we do? I know we live in a day where work is not quite as structured or isolated with working at home and fluid hours and things, but I think it would be wise to strive for this. The best rhythm of the of our week, I think, would be five full days of work. Uh, You ladies, the work you do at home, or if you work out of the home, men, same thing as you provide for your family, five days of labor. And then I think that sixth day ought to be providing for your home, working, especially for us men that were in the home, doing things that are needed, necessary chores and labor and uh, maintenance things, and even family time together. And then one day that's for the Lord, uh, Sundays as we have allocated it. And let this be the rhythm of your week. Um, When you work hard, rest fits in just how it should. When we aren't working, when we aren't laboring, rest becomes something God never intended. All right, notice the beginning of verse 10, a second aspect of this this discipline we have of distinction. He says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Number two, jot this down, we need to work at resting. We need to work hard. Number two, we need to work at resting. Here is the thing I think that is the sham of our day. It's the shame, it's it's the, the bane of our 21st century type of rhythm of our week. 
our downtime is very unintentional. Can I ask you, how many hours of TV did you watch in the last week? And you asked the same of me. How many hours did you just kind of, you were just kind of there? There was, there was no meaningful, intentional stewardship with those moments God gave you where you weren't on the clock or you weren't under the gun, as we would say. And so being very intentional at laboring, I know it sounds counterintuitive almost, working at resting, working at being intentional with how we rest. And I would be the first to acknowledge I'm not as intentional with that as I should be. The word Sabbath that's found here in verse number 9 where he says the seventh day is the Sabbath. It's a Hebrew word which carries this idea of ceasing. There's a ceasing. There's a stopping. Uh, it is a ceasing day. It's a stopping day. In, in the agriculture society that this would have been written to, it basically meant sit down and stop being in the field. Stop doing something or working up something, planting something or harvesting something in the field. Stay out of the field. Stop. And so we need to work at resting. Resting can be hard work. It's something we have to strive to be intentional with. Um, it means ceasing to find approval in others. Stop the foolish quest for your own righteousness, if that's your struggle today. Trust in God providing true health, true strength, true vitality, and true freedom. Rest from your labors. Choose to let God work in those situations. And the best analogy I've ever heard would be this. Think about this analogy of an island. An author said this, the Sabbath day was intended by God to be an island of get to and an ocean of have to. It's an island of get to. These are things I get to do. These are things I get to do, and not in a selfish way, but between me and the Lord and my family and my ministry. Uh, it is intended by God to be an island of get to and an ocean of have to's. And I feel them, don't you? The have-tos just come at you and come at you. And then, oh, I thought I was done for the day. And then this happened, or this person, or this situation, this crisis. We've got to be very intentional to allow God to give us that island where we can replenish. How many of you this morning are thinking, I wish life were busier? I wish it, was more, it were more hectic. Any of you have that sentiment? No, we have the exact opposite, don't we? I wish we could just slow down. I wish we could just have more time that's not as frantic. Can I tell you, we have that opportunity. And it may be a progressive thing in your life as you start this week to lay some of those foundational principles, but rest is a choice. It's an intentional choice. Choose it. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a day of freedom, one day in seven, where the other six, six days have no claim on you? They don't control you. Choose that. You want a day where you can say no to many of the oughts in your head. I ought to do this and ought to be here. Choose that. Let God give that to your family and to your life. All right, number two, go back to our text to verse 10. And I was struck by this as I was working through our text. I don't know that I've thought about the full implications of this before. Notice in verse 10, he says, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do, uh, not do any work. All right, and if the verse had ended there, we would have felt that it was comprehensive and it dealt with the teaching. But notice he says, Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor the ca thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Now, this is, this is huge, this one right here. For the workaholics in the room that think, I can keep this going. I can do this, and I can be the exception to what God has created for us. Number two, sanctify the Sabbath with your influence. Sanctify the Sabbath with your influence. I was talking a few weeks ago. I actually am not a huge horse race watcher person, but the, the uh, Triple Crown this year has been interesting. The Kentucky Derby, the guy who won, lost because of, of a technicality. Um, and then the Preakness was just a week or two ago. Did you see that race? Did you see the first about five seconds were probably the greatest part of the race? You know, me not being a horse person. Did you see the horse that bucked his rider? Um, his name is Bodie Express. Um, Three-year-old Colt Buck jockey John Velasquez coming out of the starting gate, then captured, this is the news story, the hearts and minds of those watching the Preakness when he ran the race without a rider. And you see, you see the horses are going like crazy, and then you got Bodie Express is like out in the wing doing his own thing all by himself. And he saw a couple of like, I don't know what you call them, trainers or people facilitating the race trying to get the horse off, and he just kept edging back in. He wanted to stay in the race, and so he just ran the whole race by himself. In the article said this, um, don't we all desire freedom? Don't we all wish to buck the troubles off our backs? Don't we all wish to live our days unencumbered by extra baggage, such as human beings being literally clinging to our sprinting bodies? 
Um, and so he's talking about the analogy of this in our own minds. But he said this at the end of the article, back to reality for a moment. Bodhi Express is officially listed as, quote, DNF, did not finish in the race. A horse cannot win a race without a rider. Now, it's all fun, and it was real interesting, but the horse was disqualified. And can I just say today, you and I can do whatever we want, but we do not live on islands. We don't live in isolation. We are impacting others. And what I was challenged by as I studied on this for today is my rest or lack of rest is hurting or helping others. And not just physically, it's impacting them spiritually as well. And so this stewardship of the Sabbath needs to be considered in the context of our influence. Matthew 2 and verse 27, Jesus said unto them, the Pharisees, the Sabbath was made for man. And this includes not just the one observing it, but others that are a part of that person's life and not man for the Sabbath. Forget the rules. Forget all the man-imposed kind of standards. The Sabbath was made for man. Are others benefiting from the Sabbath through your influence? All right, notice two areas of this influence. Number one, he says, he lists son, daughter, manservant, maidservant, and cattle. Isn't that interesting, even cattle? Number one, jot this down, two consecrations of influence that should structure our rest. These are two areas that we need to do better in that help us be more intentional with our rest. Number one, we need to consider those in our family. We need consider, to consider those in our family. Um, one of the things that I was taught at an early age, and I see it definitely not as much emphasized now as it was in those days, not because of our family or my parents per se, but certain times of the week were off limits for anything except God, for anything except family. And we live in a day now where everything is so porous, everything is so convoluted, everything is so connected that I, I regularly see parents who are not spending that time with their families intentionally. They're not spending time in church. They're not building their lives around these, these, these boundaries and these structures that facilitate relationship with the Lord. And I was reading an article the other day that captures the spirit of, of where I'm at and what I'm working through. The author says, I grew up with my parents' unswerving commitment to morning and evening worship and Sunday school and youth group and Wednesday night. Now that I'm a parent, I see how much effort it took to establish such a pattern. I always, I'll always be grateful for the ingrained habit of going to church virtually no matter what. Are we teaching, here's the question that was sobering to me, are we teaching our kids that Sunday is the day we go to church or the day we try to squeeze in church? I understand that parents may draw the line in different places, but surely there are few habits more important to pass on to our children than the rock-solid routine of going to church every Sunday. It will be hard for our children to come to the conclusion that church is important to them, uh, for them if we raise them to think it is only third or fourth priority for us. And then this challenging thought, we may see that Jesus is Lord, but end up showing that soccer is really king. We, we need to get back to, for the sake of those who come after us, to set aside times for the Lord. It's non-negotiable. He is first. He is Lord. And how we steward our Sabbath, yes, the rest is important, but so is the worship for the benefit of our kids. And I put an article in the, in the bulletin today. You can look at it. It's about on page five or six of the bulletin. Just things that we cheat our kids on. We set them up for failure when we don't keep them faithful to church. And so I encourage you to read that over on your own time some thoughts on how to consider our family and how we steward our rest. A frantic pace without a prioritized Sabbath does a great disservice to our spouse, to our kids, to our grandkids, and that impact is not just physical, but also spiritual. All right, lastly, look at the end of verse number 10. So keep the seventh sacred for the benefit of your family and those in your household. Notice then the end, the very end of verse 10 nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Number two, jot this down. We need to consider those in our family that provide structure to our rest. Number two, we need to consider the stranger. We need to consider the stranger. And here would be the thought today, how we steward our rest creates a picture of our God. Um, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Our God is like no other God, isn't he? Every other God, we have, to, we have to cajole him into favor. We have to chase after him. We have to do things and be things. 
When our God comes after us, He chases after us. He sent His Son. His Spirit is always at work, wanting to move and work in hearts. He's pursuing us. And once we receive Him, there's a finality to that. There's a rest that comes with that. And I think sometimes the way we project our Christianity, it's we're working, we're trying to earn, we're frantic, we're, we're hectic. And when someone has a spiritual need, and specifically when they're seeking God, we have no time left to minister to them, we have no strength left, we have no unction left to be Christ to them. Christ had time for people. God has time for people. Many times if we can't carve out rest, we definitely don't have time left to be a minister and testimony of Jesus Christ. And so our stewardship of the Sabbath rest principle is forming an opinion of God. It's framing an opinion of God in the lives and hearts of others. And I'll give you just one practical example on this. I hope you'll not go to seed on this. I don't mow my grass on Sunday. I know I'm old school. But I don't mow my grass for a couple of reasons. One, the boys inside the house that I probably would send out to mow it anyway, but they would be watching. Uh, my family, you church members that have that same conviction, hey, what's the preacher doing mowing his grass on Sunday? But thirdly, it's my neighbors. It's others that know of, of my God and my claim to him. And there's something special about Sunday. It's set aside for him, not in a legalistic way, but in a representative way that God matters. He factors into how I manage my week. I don't care if it mowed Monday or it's rained Monday through Saturday, it's going to uh, rain again on Monday. I'm not going to mow my grass on Sunday. Do you have those kind of commitments for the testimony and honor and glory of Jesus Christ. It is a moral issue, not because of what we're doing or not doing, but how it portrays and, and, and pictures the God that we claim to serve. All right, lastly, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4, and let's spend a few minutes there. And I hope God will work in your heart, I'm not trying to lay down anything specific for you that's right or wrong necessarily, but just letting God work in your heart to allow you to intentionally build into your life seasons of rest and worship. Hebrews chapter 4, and let's look, if you will, at verse number 9. Hebrews chapter 4, and let's begin in verse number 9. Before we get to that, I was reading uh, a uh, book that was talking about the French Revolution. I don't know if you've ever studied on the French Revolution. I don't know if I was thinking of that because I'd just been in D.C. recently, but the French Revolution and the American Revolution could not have been more different, Correct. More, more different in their, their emphases and their philosophy. Um, the American Revolution was not perfect in any sense of the word, but there was a motive of religious liberty. There was an emphasis upon God and faith in God, and motivations often were fueled by that. In contrast, the French Revolution basically was France setting aside Christianity, setting aside any resemblance or uh, even form of godliness, form of religiosity. It was discarded in a blatant uh, kind of form. On October 23rd, 1793, just nine days after Queen uh, Marie Antoinette was executed, the Republic calendar was decreed. And the spirit of this counter that they institute was literally to de-Christianize or to take God even out of their day-to-day -day activities. And so they instituted what they <laughs> called the Republic uh, calendar. Uh, the reason for it was to oppose religion. It was to keep uh, this goal of promoting reason and opposing religion. Um, and so the reform lasted uh, for just a little while. The reason it became difficult to maintain this method was because everybody else in the country was still operating on a seven-day calendar, a seven-day month, as opposed to ten. The second reason was the workers of France began to realize they only got one day off in ten. And that was really what led to them discarding the calendar. And so just 12 years after they launched this glorious, sophisticated Republican calendar, it was uh, legislated out of uh, relevance. I've seen man over and over try to do that. Maybe you don't try to change the calendar. You wouldn't be that egotistical, but you have your own calendar you're working on. And it's a calendar that is not aligned with God's intention for you. Six days you labor and one day you rest. And I would submit to you to change the calendar is to fight against your maker. God made you. God redeemed you. And to do anything except what he has instructed is to be in a bad position. All right, Hebrews chapter four, look if you will at verse uh, number 9. Hebrews chapter 4, and let's begin in verse 9. We all know the verses at the end of this text, verse 12, about the Word of God, the high priestly activity of Jesus Christ in verses 14 to 16, but these previous verses are what set up this confidence that we have in the Lord. Verse 9, 
There, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Do you see that pattern there? Verse 11, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And so we see this command that we are to labor into rest. If you go back to the beginning of the chapter, we won't for sake of time, but he talks about those who would not enter into the rest. They chose to not enter into all that God had promised them, and we have a choice as well. It is a choice and it is a labor to enter into this rest. For those who believe there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, as referenced in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9, it's something we must strive to enter into. How do we do that? Well, if you look there back at the text, he says, cease from your own works as God did from his. We follow his pattern. We cease from work and we rest in what God has provided for us. So with that being said, you say, Pastor, okay, that all sounds good. How do we put that into practice? How do we apply the fourth command? Do we apply the fourth command? And I would say to a careful answer to should we follow the Sabbath or not is this, yes, but. Yes, but. Yes, we should practice Sabbath rest. But obviously we understand that now in the New Testament there's a change, there's a pivot, there's an expansion of God's revelation, and therefore we need His help to apply it in a way that honors Him. Let me give you three things. Would you jot these down now on the slides or in your, your notes there? How do we keep the fourth command? Uh, and before I give those to you, I often hear the following applications. You don't eat out at restaurants on Sunday. Um, you have to take a nap for a certain amount of time. I'd be, I'm for that, by the way. I will stand with you in that sense of conviction if you want to. Um, can't watch sports or I can on Sunday. Um, those kind of things. Can I just say that's way out of the, the core of this issue. It's, it's not in the center of what God has, I believe, for us. Can I give you three things quickly? Number one, jot this down, set aside one day in seven for corporate worship. Set aside one day in seven for corporate worship. And I think for the New Testament believer, that would be obviously the first day of the week. Here are ways we can keep the fourth commandment, the spirit of this command in our day. Set aside one day in seven for corporate worship. And don't let anything conflict with that. I know there are exceptions to that. But honor God, set aside one in seven for corporate worship. Put him first. I think even when you're on vacation. Radical it sounds. You should go to church when you're on vacation on Sunday. Uh, honor God. Set one day aside in seven for corporate worship. Uh, and what that does is it keeps a weekly intentional structure that's built around the Lord. God, you're there. First day of the week, I meet with you, just like I meet with you the first hours of the day. Uh, you're first. Set aside one day in seven for corporate worship. Number two, jot this down. This is a tough one for me to even say because you're going to hold me accountable to this. Trust Christ enough to stop working physically and rest. Trust Christ enough to stop working physically and rest. You have times where you show God, I trust you, by just stopping doing anything. Um, I'm not changing anything. I'm not fixing anything. I'm not working in any way. Trust Christ enough to stop working physically and rest. Do you have that regularly in your life? Is it a rhythm? It's a non-negotiable. Is it something that you have? If not, can I ask you, encourage you, God... His calling always assumes his enabling. You may say, Pastor, I don't think I can rest. I saw a video the other day. It was, this is parenthood, and it showed a mama pig in a pen, and then just little piglets just running around and around and around for hours around this pig. You may feel like that's your life right now, but God's called you to be a mom, has he not? He's also called you to rest. Same for the dads, those that have to work long hours to provide for your family, whatever the specific situation you're in. Trust Christ enough to stop working physically and have a season of rest. All right, third one, and this would be the, the gospel-centered application. Jot this down. Find spiritual rest in Christ every day of the week. Find spiritual rest in Christ every day of the week. You do know that Hebrews chapter 4 is not just talking about a day off. You do know that, right? He's talking about a spiritual level of rest. It's interesting to me, the Sabbath often has been, mis has been distorted into earning God's favor or keeping God's favor. When that's the exact opposite of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a time to say, I recognize God, I rest from all labor. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then we're created to be his workmanship unto good works. 
but our salvation does not depend upon our good works. And so we rest in Christ. Do you have that rest? Some of you, the gnawing unsettledness in your soul is you've yet to put faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ for salvation. Rest in that. Place your faith in that alone for salvation. You don't need to do something or stop doing something. Rest in what has been done through the finished work of Jesus Christ. So these three things today, set aside one day in seven for corporate worship. Are you doing that? If you're not, you're not in line with the fourth commandment. Uh, Put that on the priority list. Number two, are you trusting Christ enough to stop working physically and to rest? And thirdly, are you finding, are you exhibiting spiritual rest in Christ every day of the week? came across this quote the other day that really challenged me because I, I often hear people pit the law and grace against each other. You're either under the law or you're under grace. And I would challenge that way of thinking. Christ said, as I alluded to it a moment ago, Christ came not to destroy the law but to fulfill it and to enable us progressively to be more in those areas. We're free not for our flesh. We're free to, to obey God and honor God in these expectations he's given. But here's the statement that I thought was challenging. Author said this, what do we lose? He just asked this question as he sees it being lost in our day. What do we lose when we lose the Sabbath? We lose grace. It is a place, it's a moment, it's a season of our life where God, his grace, I'm not talking salvation-wise, I'm just talking his grace works. You may know his grace when you're stressed. Do you know his grace when you're resting? There are nuances of it. There are are variations of His grace that you only can feel and sense and then reflect to others when you are resting on a regular basis. Um, You may know His grace when you're busy and you got to try to keep all the balls in the air. Do you know His grace when you need to just stop and let Him hold the world and everything else in His hands? Are you learning His grace? Are you exhibiting His grace through seasons of rest? Here's the question, and we're done today. Will you observe the Sabbath more intentionally by remembering rest? you got everything else on your calendar this week. My question to you is, do you have rest on there? Are you remembering rest? And when you pencil it into that corner of that block on your calendar, are you thinking about creation that God included on his calendar? Are you thinking of redemption that God took the time to, to redeem his people that they might rest in him? And number two, are you willing also to sanctify it? You can put it on the calendar but are still things going to try to creep in? Still things going to try to distract you? Are you willing to set apart that time for the glory and honor of God? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today.